my name's Benjamin Law. I am technically called the Master of Curious Conversations here. That is my official title. It sounds slightly like a kink role, but it's very science-based. Um, and I am so happy to be here with you tonight here on the lands of the Turrbal and Yuggera people. Um, First Nations people on this continent have been here discovering science, making art, sharing knowledge here for tens of thousands of years. Together they constitute the oldest continuing human civilization the planet has ever seen. And we are very grateful to elders past and present that we can still discover, share stories and knowledge here on what is and what will always be Aboriginal land. Now, we're talking about the hyper-connected underworld. That could mean so many different things, really. But tonight, we're talking about the hyper-connected underworld of mycelium fungus. Fungus, right? You can eat it. Uh, it can kill you. Uh, it can make you hallucinate. Um, but mycelium, the vegetative part of fungus, is all around us. It is in our soil. It's vital to our ecosystems. It breaks down organic material for reuse. And they're also a vital communication and nutrient network supporting 92% of Earth's flora, providing the planet's hyper-connected underworld that we're talking about tonight. Now, I almost flunked a lot of high school science, so I'm going to need help from our guest tonight. Um, three people who have been exploring this hyperconnected underground world in different ways. Now, our first guest is a documentary filmmaker whose award-winning projects have screened internationally in festivals and on TV. She's a 2019 Walkley Award finalist and has worked on ABC programs across TV, including the much-loved Compass. Is that right? I want to make sure I've got my details right. And her passion for the weird and wonderful world of fungi has seen her team up with another guest here tonight in a new international series of documentaries under the planet under the banner, rather, of Planet Fungi. Please welcome to the stage, Catherine Masiniak. Thank you very much. Thank welcome, you. Catherine. Next to Catherine, we have an ambassador for Sony Australia who has an international reputation as a specialist in nature photography with a particular passion in macro fungi photography. He also has a unique expertise in time-lapse photography of fungi. His photographs and time-lapses have appeared in National Geographic magazines, on the BBC to, uh, Planet Earth 2 documentary, the Australian Conservation Foundation calendars, and many, many more. Please welcome Stephen Axford to the stage, everyone. Stephen, welcome. Thank you. And last but not least, our final guest is a part of the female-led creative technology collective Electrolab, whose interactive installation, The Magic of Mycelium, can be seen as part of Curiosity Brisbane. It is not far away, is it? So straight after this, you could totally see it. Um, her work stretches across music, new media, wearables, installations, and she is also an amateur mycologist and is currently experimenting with growing mycelium into moulds as a material for use in her work. Please welcome Tara Pattenden, everyone. Hi, thanks, Ben. I am so thrilled to do this deep dive with the three of you tonight into a world that I think is all around us, but maybe a lot of us take for granted or don't even understand. Stephen, I'm going to start with you. Why fungi? Why mushrooms? Why mycelium? Well, I... I started, I've been walking around forests for about 25 years and I started to notice fungi. And probably the best way to show why they were so fascinating to me is to show you a few pictures. Let's show the real. Now what are we about to see? Is it a video or some images? It's a bit of both. Bit of both. It'll just give you a, a bit of a picture as to why I found it so fascinating. Great. That's a starfish stinkhorn, for those of you who don't know. Get them in garden mulch. This one's Mycena liana. And this is a Crepidotus semonicolor. Mm. 
And these are some of the luminous fungi we get around here. Around Brisbane region. And this is what fungus is really all about because the, the pictures of mushrooms we saw up until now were all just the fruiting bodies of fungus, like the apples on a tree. And a fungus will fruit when in the right conditions. But the fungus is really mycelium which grows in the soil. So when you're walking in the forest, every teaspoon of fungus underneath you, every teaspoon of soil underneath your feet contains several kilometres of these fine threads of hyphae and mycelium. The hyphae are the microscopic threads that bundle into fibres, like you can see in the picture there. Mm. Where is the picture shown, by the way? Oh, Where? I think uh, on these large screens on either side, so oh, okay. hopefully everyone will be able to see them. So I, I want to make sure I point to the right thing. <laughs> <laughs> We've got a monitor screen here. Uh, Stephen, as we see these images, it reminds me that you have a video on YouTube titled How Fungi Changed My View of the World, and it's essentially... Um, a 30-minute video, uh, and it's not any ordinary video because it's already been viewed 1.2 million times, and that's on the platform of YouTube. As I understand it, on Chinese platforms, it's been viewed even more millions of times. Uh, it's quite remarkable. If you want to see more images like this, uh, Google how fungi changed my view of the world. So photographing mushrooms, you've said before, has become a passion that's completely changed my view of the world. How so? Well, I think in the, the talk, I, I said, to start with, in the forest, instead of looking up, I'd look down at my feet, which you're told is not what you're meant to do. You're meant to look up and see the world. Well, you look down and you see another world. And then there was... As I studied the, the beauty of mushrooms and fungi, I also started studying the science. And I started to realise that fungi wasn't just an offshoot of plants or something small. It's a kingdom that contains probably over 6 million species, which is about 25 times the number of species of plants there on the, are on the planet. That the mushrooms and fungi are really critical to life. We wouldn't be here if there wasn't fungus in the world. There wouldn't be any life on land if there wasn't any fungus in the world. That the first, the first creatures that inhabited land were actually fungi and plants came afterwards. And the only reason that plants could survive on land because it was been prepared by fungus. Catherine, you and Stephen often collaborate uh, capturing the world of fungi. What was your access point? Where did you start first fostering your interest in this subterranean hyperconnected world? <laughs> well, like Steve, I, I'm also a photographer and videographer. So even now when I look back at some of my bushwalking photographs, because we're both very keen bushwalkers, um, Back in my 20s, I found fungi photographs. Can you believe it? <laughs> the signs were there from the start. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I think for me it was... Uh, well, the beauty of Steve's photography really captivated me. I mean, he's really very good at what he does. Um, and then, then I've always been a bit of a, a geek. You know, I love science and I love learning about the natural world. And, yeah, when we started to realise how... Fungi was everywhere, like it's in the leaves and of trees. People are finding 200 different species of microfungus in a, in a leaf. Um, or that, you know, a fungi can connect one tree on one side of the forest to a tree on the other side of the forest. And within that network, a lot of stuff is happening. They're feeding the trees with minerals and water and the trees are feeding the fungus with sugars from photosynthesis but they're also communicating about you know if a parasite hits one tree then the via the fungus the, another tree will find out and start to prepare itself for that attack so there's an incredible amount of um, 
uh, fungus is doing all this stuff that is actually outside of our what we think about when we think about plants and animals. Mm. Yeah. You know, you're actually reminding me of um, a novel that came out several years ago um, that was all about the interconnectedness of plant life. It was called The Overstory. It won the Pulitzer Prize um, a couple of years back. And I have to admit that it wasn't until I read that novel that I actually realised plant life could communicate to each other and that they were sending signals to each other. And I think for maybe a lot of people outside of um, the realm of science, that still kind of, kind of sounds a little bit strange, that, that trees are communicating through. What you're saying is essentially a natural version of the internet. That's right. Fungal network. Yeah, mm. absolutely, through the fungal network. And the other thing about fungi that also captivated us is how they're this little chemical factory. You know, um, it's no... Um, penicillin is... Everybody knows about penicillin being fungus, but, you know, fungi are now used in um, uh, anti-rejection drugs in transplants. They're used in um, chemotherapy. They're used mm. in statins for blood pressure. They're used for epilepsy. So there's a, an awful lot of things that fungi does. And so then when we think about, well... That tree is poisonous. Is it the tree that's poisonous or is it the fungi mm. inside the tree that's causing it to be poisonous? So there's a whole new frontier of scientific discovery happening at the moment because all the scientists are playing catch-up. Mm. You know, this kingdom has been ignored because most of the time the only way we know it's there is because of mushroom fruits and, and also DNA barcode testing has really revolutionised identifying fungus. But out of those... The latest figures being 6.2 million possible species of fungi on the planet. We've only documented 150,000. Mm. So it's an incredible area of discovery. Yeah. Tara, I want to move to you now because um, we've probably come at a time where it's best to view your artwork, The Magic of Mycelium, which really comes alive at, at night. Before we talk about the artwork, similar question, where does your interest in mycelium fungi come from? So my interest in mycelium and fungi, I guess, originated with foraging. I used to live in Helsinki, and from there you do just part of the culture is to hunt for mushrooms. And so my, through, through my friends there, I would go hunting mushrooms, and for the first year I never found anything, so it made me even more resolved to find something. Um, I guess also from that, Foraging is a bit like op shopping or something. It's like bargain <laughs> hunting, like you're getting these awesome things. You're looking out for a specific type. Um, and I think that also really is what interests me about it or what keeps me engaged. That is such a wholesome scene that you've set for us, foraging for mushrooms in Helsinki. The other thing that always, um, you know, I'm, I'm delighted and fascinated by when people tell me they forage for mushrooms is like, how quickly do you learn which ones are toxic and may kill you? So I know a few that I make sure that I find out mushrooms that don't have a look-alike that can kill you. Uh. So there's about four or five that I know, and anything I'm not sure about, maybe I'll just take photos of. <laughs> and at what point did you start thinking, actually, this is a really interesting thing I want to explore in my art practice? So a couple of years ago, I guess, I moved back to Australia and foraging was a bit more out of the question, or foraging for food mushrooms. I didn't know enough. So I looked at uh, into growing them, um, and that's where I learnt more about mycelium and then also being used in biofabrication and a whole heap of other things. That last word that you just said, what is it and what does it mean? Bio... Biofabrication. What is that? What does it mean? I guess that's the use of mycelium in building materials or other materials and fabrics, and it's being used widely already. Um, so this is something we were talking about backstage before, and I think this is something that uh, maybe some of you are already familiar with, but a lot of you may not be. The idea that mycelium is being used as, uh, in a lot of ways, in textiles, in computing even, it sounds like. What, what, what kind of exists already, and where are we heading with mycelium? Who wants to jump in? So mycelium has been used now for almost a decade as a substitute for paper packaging, um, primarily in the US and the UK. And, and, you know, they just basically, you know, you're getting a computer part, you want it set inside something, they have a mould, they grow the mycelium to that mould and there's your packaging. And the great thing about it is it just decomposes it back into soil. So 
um, it is a way that we could solve some of the really big problems that we're creating by having too much packaging. The other thing that's happening at the moment, some very exciting science, because we, as everybody knows, you've all seen those horrific images of the plastic rafts in the ocean, and you know we're really drowning in our own trash. And um, in people that we collaborate with in Yunnan, uh, myco mycologists have found 20 fungi that decompose, recycle plastic. Um, also rubber tyres, but that's, <laughs> that's the early days. And so, you know, they're really at the point now where they're going to see how they can industrialise that by symbiosis, combining the fungi with the bacteria, um, the enzyme that does that. So if that works, I mean, that's going to be massive in terms of solving a really big problem that we've got. Um, Fungi are also being used in Africa, piloted to kill the malaria mosquitoes. So, How, how does that even work? <laughs> so, I don't know if people uh, remember the zombie ant that was in one oh, of David's. Oh, the zombie Ab ant. <laughs> we all remember. No, no, tell us about the zombie ant. <laughs> There's also a zombie cicada. cicada. Yeah. Nature's terrifying, <laughs> really. I mean, it, it truly is. Like with the zombie ant, what's its relationship with mycelium? Well, there, there are different types of fungus, and one, uh, one type is parasitic fungus. So, and with insects, there's, uh, insects have a lower body temperature than we do. Fungus doesn't tend to attack us particularly because we've got a body temperature way above 30 degrees, and fungus doesn't do very well at that temperature. But insects can cool down a lot more than that, and fungus does very well. And there's often a specific fungus for a specific insect and it will infect the insect, gradually consume the body and say with the zombie ant, it takes over the nervous system of the ant, causes the ant to climb up a metre or two above the ground, fasten its mandibles onto a leaf or a twig and die. And if any of the other ants in the nest find an infected ant, they'll kill it and drag it as far away from the nest as possible. So... So then the fungi fruits when it's up high and the spores all fall out. So the thing that infects the insect is the mycelium, right? Uh, yes. So, so with the malaria mosquito, they've taken a cordyceps, is what they're commonly called, um, and in, infected the malaria mosquito with this mm. cordyceps, so it kills the mosquito. The only problem was that it didn't kill it fast enough before it had bred, so then they supercharged it with funnel web spider venom. Oh, wow, okay. <laughs> Again, symbiosis, so really, really fascinating science. Yeah, 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 this is like yeah. Marvel Cinematic Universe kind of <laughs> level, like, uh, that's incredible. I mean, when you tell me that story, especially about the zombie ant, I wonder, obviously, the mycelium is behaving in a way where it's able to extend its reach. Is it sentient? Well, it's hard to say that it's sentient, but it certainly does things that a sentient being would do as well. It's affecting something sentient, though, isn't it? It's affecting something. But for an example, uh, there's a cordyceps fungi that infects cicadas, and it infects the cicada and takes over... It, it, consumes the body, the back part of the body, but not the musculature that controls the wings. Uh -huh. And then takes over the central nervous system and causes the infected cicada to fly and the fruiting bodies have already come out of the cicada and spread the spores from a flying cicada. Mm. Couldn't have a better platform. Yeah. It uses two drugs to control, control the nervous system of the cicada, amphetamine and psilocybin. Hmm. So at least if the cicada dies, at least it dies happy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Cicadas, all of them speed freaks. Um, <laughs> <laughs> hey, Tara, back to you. Um, I understand that you're an amateur, what's the word for it, mycologist? Mycologist, yeah. Now, does it, you, you mentioned before that you're growing mushrooms. Is that what, an, uh, so increasingly people are growing mushrooms in their kitchens, right? Is that where you've left it or does mycology take that further somehow? 
I've done one experiment with building fiberglass moulds to grow mycelium in. I was working with Little Acre, who are a mushroom farm in West End. Um, I think they've moved now. But yeah, we started on that project and it was to be exhibited in London, but COVID what happened. What was the project? Like, tell us what it was. So the project was to develop, use mycelium as a material for building synthesizers. So I build musical synthesizers normally. Um, and so mycelium was the fabric we were going to use, but then in the actual wiring of the way the synthesizer was built, it was also going to replicate a network. So mycelium's in a network, and one of the powerful things about a network is that part of it can go down and the rest of it still runs. So I was going to build a synthesizer, and we still will, but it's sort of on the back burner. Uh, I mean, when you say that, we were going to build a synthesizer with mycelium, that, that does sound like kind of the, the science and art world's version of pole vaulting, which is like, <laughs> where do you begin? Are we talking about, I don't know, 3D printing, or what kind of technologies are used to make that even possible? So I was just going to be using fiberglass moulds for uh -huh. the container for the electronics and then conceptually the way I was building the electronics were in a network. Mm -hmm. So normally an electronic circuit wouldn't, would be like a loop rather than a network but it would be in a network and then you'd perform the synth by breaking off parts of it as you played and it would keep going so you'd demonstrate that network. Wow. Okay, so one of the... Uh, that's still in process, right? That's still in process, the, yeah. The thing that we all can see tonight and over the weekend throughout Curiosity until it finishes on Sunday is the installation you've already got there called the Magic of Mycelium. These are these beautiful illuminated domes that I think represent... Do they represent the networks of mycelium? Yeah, so there's four nodes and we've got lighting in them to sort of replicate images of mycelium. Um, and have, create an imaginary network underground. And we've also got this augmented reality that you can play along with it and you can walk through it and move through the mycelium. So the AR component that we're seeing now on screen, yeah. is that what we're going to see if we use our phones to access that kind of visual? Is that right? Yeah, so on the stand, I don't know what it's called, that's near it, there's uh, the QR code where you can download an app called Styly and view that. You need to place the mycelium on the ground, so you need to use your phone, place the animation, and then you can walk all the way through it. Wow. What, what's the process of making that? I mean, how long did that take to make? Because it's not just sculpture, it's not just electronics, it's combining and marrying them with things like AR as well. Yeah, so the whole thing, we've been, I've been working with Michelle Brown, who I run Electrolab with, and we've been working on it sort of solidly the past two months. Uh, Michelle is responsible for doing the AR and she works a lot in augmented reality and 3D animation. Uh, I think she painted this in a program called Tilt Brush. I'm not 100% sure about that, but so she's doing painting within virtual reality to create this and then using the Styly app to, for the actual augmentation placement. Am I right in that this is like the world premiere of this of yep. this installation? So whenever you're premiering something, whenever something uh, debuts out into the world, you're doing it for the first time. What did you learn through this process about making this? What were the surprises and challenges in bringing the magic of mycelium to life along the way? Uh, there are a few surprises. So the scale, there were, luckily we, we, they're 1.5 metres wide and when we first got the domes we were like, are these going to fit through the door of our studio? And luckily they just did, but I think we'd probably measure things a little bit better next time. Um, and also they're interactive as well. So you can go up and the uh, movements of the lights will change as you get closer. Yeah. And I guess we'd like to explore interaction with multiple people or the domes as well. Mm. So time. the interactive, what have been the most interesting reactions to the work so far over the course of the festival? Because there's only two more days to go, right? Yeah. It's a bit hard to see what people are doing, but I have seen people sort of walking around with their phones. <laughs> there's a lot of kids climbing on them, so I think we'd maybe incorporate that next time as well. So they're not technically kid-proof, or they've proven to be so far? They've proven to be kid-proof <laughs> so far, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, really interesting, one of the other installations, Microbiota, which you might have seen um, in South Bank, it's made of recycled kid slide parts to represent microbiota. 
it looks very inviting to uh, climb on. And I asked um, the artist, you know, what happens if someone climbs on it? Will they get stuck in one of the microbiota parts? And he reassured me that they had been polished with turtle wax. <laughs> so there's only a certain point that you can climb up until you just start sliding off it. Uh, anyway, good, good <laughs> hack. Good hack there. Um, let's move on to the work that Catherine and Stephen, you're both doing with Planet Fungi. This is the fungi empire you're <laughs> building. Um, I want to know, as, as much as you're making content around and for Planet Fungi, what's the process that's actually involved? It was really interesting hearing Tara's process just then in terms of making the magic of mycelium, but when you're doing something like the time lapses we see, capturing something so small in image, what equipment do you need? What's, what's involved? Well, a couple of sheds. I use the main shed I use is a half shipping container. So I've got that parked down in the garden. I've got we've got eight acres of land, so there's plenty of room. Okay, can you just take us on a guided mental tour at least? You walk into the shed, what do we see? How's it set up? You you see a lot of dead logs. So I, I take bits of wood in there that have mushrooms growing on them. When the mushrooms stop growing, I'll put the bits of wood on the ground and wait for mushrooms to grow again. Because mushrooms tend to grow in the same place all the time. Mm. If you've got a bit of dead wood, the mushrooms will come up on the wood. When the weather conditions are right again, the mushrooms will come up again. Mm. So, and then I've got, I think in that shed, I've got four cameras, tripods, power supplies, lights. What? A hose. A hose. <laughs> Tell us about the hose. Why well, is the hose necessary? The hose is to keep the mushrooms moist because mm. mushrooms don't grow if it's dry. Mm. Of course, cameras work best in the dry, unfortunately. So how do you keep those two things, um, you know, working in tandem but also apart so one doesn't kill the other? <laughs> I, I try not to hose the cameras because <laughs> that, that's genuinely bad that's for usually them. bad, yeah. So uh, I've got the cameras there and over time I've worked out how much water, you know, how to keep the cameras relatively dry. But really I do occasionally have to spend a significant amount of money on fixing the cameras because they don't, they're not really used to the conditions like that, particularly when it gets, say, up to 35 degrees mm -hmm. and really humid, they really don't like that at all. Well, we talked to Tara just before about trial and error and the things that you learn along the way in terms of surprises. You've been doing this for a while now. What are the biggest lessons that you've learned in order to capture fungi, fungi the way that you have? What do, what, does, what do you wish the former version of you knew before you started? It, there's so many different things that you learn. You put a log down and you say, well, the mushroom's going to come up here and it's going to be so high and it's going to take so long. It doesn't necessarily follow those instructions. It might grow out there, be this high and take a day instead of a week or it might grow really slowly, only get up to this high and take a month. So... You just learn to be patient, guesswork, mm. and keep trying. Can, one of the things about the time lapses that Steve does is that they're not cultivated fungi. Mm. They're fungi, forest fungi, so that's what makes them quite unique because a lot of time lapses you see are cultivated because you know people have learned how to control those situations. And so some, and it's time lapse. Mm. So you're taking a frame every, you know. Let's say five minutes. Every five mm. minutes. So it's very unpredictable. Mm. You know, the fungi, that, that first one that people saw of the one erupting out of an egg, <laughs> you know, you can have a camera on that egg for a month and nothing happens. Mm. And then when it does happen, it happens like in an hour or so. So you've got to have enough frames going right. to capture that, which means that your poor camera has been taking all those frames for weeks and weeks and weeks until it actually So happens. if it's wild, essentially, I don't know if that's the right word, but uh, as opposed to cultivated, it will behave in wild ways that are unanticipated. That's right. Right. What, what do you find easy and difficult about the work that Planet Fungi does? Um, oh, gee. <laughs> Catherine's the filmmaker. 
I take the time lapse, Catherine creates the films, all the internet interactions. You've got to do a, an amazing amount of work to become popular on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> it's not overnight popularity. We, we've been doing this for, what, 10 years? And what do you think it is about the content that has resonated so much with people? When you get the feedback from your viewers all around the world, what's the constant thing that people say? What draws them in? The beauty and the magic. I mean, forest fungi are just, especially here in Australia, we are a hotspot for fungi in this country. Um, and that's partly because we've still got a lot of our rainforests. But the rainforest fungi is just so beautiful and so diverse. It's just extraordinary. And I think that that just captures people's imaginations. So we've, in our kind of building an audience and, um, and education around fungi, we've focused on the beauty and the science. They're, they've been our two key things. So when I make films, you know, we, we do our... We make films about our fungi safaris overseas. We get invited. The photo see, the photographs have changed our lives. Steve started as a photographer taking these amazing photos of fungi that people just loved and it started going viral. And then that just kept leading on to things. We started playing with time lapse and then he got excellent at that. And then people started seeing that, inviting us overseas to document the fungi in some of the most remote forests on the planet, you know, in Assam, in Magalia, in... Burma, Myanmar, you know, Nepal, China. It's been an amazing journey that we've been travelling. And then when we're there, we record the ethnomycology mm. of the local people because in Yunnan they eat 900 species of fungi, oh. you know, 900 species. Mexico, 600. So we're a very fungiphobic country in Australia. It's not just button, Swiss, Anoki and shiitake no. people. There's a whole other world out there. <laughs> there, are, there are cities we've been to that are dedicated to mushrooms, mm. where they'll have markets that sell nothing but mushrooms. Wow. They have murals on the wall. They have competitions, really high-level competitions. King of the mushroom competition. Yeah. Oh, you're making me think of the video game Zelda now and all the mushrooms <laughs> in, in that world as well. Um, you know, Tara, we've heard about... Um, the beauty and the science that people are drawn to when they see the videos. What do you want people thinking about or feeling as they engage with the magic of mycelium, the work that you've provided for curiosity? Well, we're really interested in the networks, I guess, as a metaphor for community as well. So the mycelium networks are non-hierarchical, they're sort of sharing information. So we're hoping socialist fungi. Yeah, socialist fungi. So I guess we're hoping to get that idea across. But also we're hoping that people will play with them so that you'll interact, that you'll enjoy walking through and sort of experiencing maybe a, a size change. You're there in the mycelium. You can, you're can, you not supposed to, but everyone's crawling on top of them. Um, and even playing with the sensors too, so to see your interaction and how you're interacting with the lights. Tell, tell me about that again. The sensors are interactive. What are they doing and what happens as you get closer and further away? So as you get closer and further away to the uh, domes, you're controlling the speed of the lights and also mm. at what point in the colour palette it's starting. Mm. So there's two main light patterns happening, sort of a zoom and then a, a speckly confetti type pattern. And as you get closer, it gets faster and faster and with the zooming pattern, it gets brighter and brighter. Wow, that sounds so sophisticated and, and complex, but I feel like that's a great homage to uh, something that is incredibly sophisticated and complex. While we've got the three of you here, can I ask you all to be a bit science teachery with us? Because I'm sure we can like go home, watch documentaries, find out really cool things about mycelium, but can you tell us some like really cool facts, trivia that's blown you away while you've been working on and researching mycelium and fungi in your own way? So when fungi populated the planet with plants, it was a very arid environment and fungi is really good at that. You know, like um, we documented a whole bunch of fire-loving fungi coming up after the fires last year in 2019. With the forest was still smoking and there was fungus coming up helping to hold the ash down, prepare the soil for new plants. But the, the wow fungi fact that kind of comes off that for me is that 
inside the Chernobyl reactor, where nothing can live, they've found fungus. No way. And what is it doing? You know, is it is it it's um, plotting. using the <laughs> radioactive? It, it's difficult to take experiments there. No, no I can't imagine. <laughs> it's very hard to monitor. I imagine. So, so they've only got a little bit, but they they think it's actually feeding on the radiation. Wow. It uses melanin, which as you know, is in our skin. This is the start of so many superhero films. It's very, really, <laughs> really cool. <laughs> but how remarkably resilient and robust that it can still exist in the most hostile yeah. of environments. I mean, I, I can't, I, I'd struggle to think of anywhere more hostile than that. That's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. What about you, Tara? Any cool facts that you want to share? I mean, that's a pretty cool fact. Um, there's a couple <laughs> of things. I guess there's... Um, Maybe it's not a fact about Fongi, but it's a fact about how it, Fongi seems to be in the zeitgeist at the mm. moment. And I, are you a Star Trek fan at all? Um, uh, no, but I have many friends who are. So, so I'm adjacent to the community. Yeah, Star Trek adjacent, yeah. <laughs> so uh, perhaps you know then that the most recent Star Trek, Star Trek Discovery has Paul Stamets, who's a mushroom researcher, written some books that are pretty interesting as one of the characters and they actually use the mycelial network to travel around in Star Trek. Oh, that is so cool. I mean, when you're talking about science fiction, it makes me wonder about the future uses of mycelium. It's something that we've all kind of touched on in the conversation already, but uh, as people discover more about this ubiquitous kind of hiding in plain sight thing, um, that's all around us right now. What are the conversations about where we're heading with its use? So one of the biggest problems we've got on the planet is we use a lot of resources for building materials. And so there's this amazing project. This is the one that really blows my mind happening in the UK and Europe at the moment, massive funding from the UN, to use mycelium to not just make bricks in a mould, but to actually grow a building Oh my gosh, grow a building. What, grow. Is that, what does that look like? How does that work? I don't know. I'm, I'm yet to, they say they're going to have a prototype by the end of this year. That YouTube video is going to go off, so you better right. be onto it. So as, the, as it grows the building, the mycelium does two things. It becomes the building material for the building, but it also, um, combined with nanotechnology, becomes the um, sensory part of the building so that it can decide if the temperature's too hot, um, it can decide if there's pollutants, um, if it's, you know, you need more light, and it can also repair the building itself. Mm. So, so not only will it be do what it does underground and in the leaves and in the trunks, it will be the sensory component, but it will also combine with nanotechnology, analyse that data and then adjust the building for that. And I also know that NASA and a company in the US are piloting a project at the moment to use mycelium to grow structures on the moon as well. So take the mycelium. And the thing about my growing buildings from mycelium is you're using recycled products to grow the mycelium. Mm. So you're using, you know, stuff that we'd throw away, organic um, refuse from agricultural processes to grow the mycelium. So you're upcycling the substrate yeah, and then growing something that then can be recycled. Yeah, wow, we're always talking about the kind of zero-waste circular economy, but this sounds like it could be quite central to it all. That's yeah, very, very we, cool. We need to learn to use nature rather than to ignore nature. We, we've got it all wrong with the way things work in the world. That fungus, by studying fungus, you learn that, that there's this concept of symbiosis, where the fungus helps the trees, the trees help the fungus. But everything works on symbiosis. We're a symbiotic organism. Our gut bacteria wouldn't live without us and we wouldn't live without the gut bacteria. That's what symbiosis is. And all of nature is this huge web of symbiosis. And if we can learn how to use that, we don't need to waste the resources. The fungus can get all the minerals we ever needed. It's perfect at doing that. It can go down and dissolve minerals with organic acids and just bring them out of the rock because there's pl plenty of resources down there. It's just we regard, you know, in mining, we say, oh, 1% of a particular element is not economical to, to get. 
or if we use mycelium, it is. It's perfectly okay to get it then. And it doesn't damage the world in doing it. I am going to open up the conversation to the audience in a second, but just before we do, uh, I know this sounds very much like a teenage question, but do you have a favourite fungi and why? <laughs> yeah, there's so many beautiful ones, but I think one of my favourites is Mycena Interrupter. It's a, it's a great name. <laughs> it's a very cool name. It's a beautiful fungus that um, quite a number of people flock to Tasmania like April, May for fungi season and it's just this beautiful blue mushroom. Called Pixie's Parasol. Pixie's Parasol. Can you eat prominent. it? No. No. Okay. That's a very American comment. <laughs> <laughs> it's also very Chinese. We just eat everything. So um, what, what about you, Stephen? What's your... It, it, it actually is edible. It but, actually is edible. But not for humans. Oh, okay. What, what gets to eat it? Insects. Oh, they love it. okay. Yeah. And we and can eat fact, the insects. And in fact, doing a time lapse um, two years ago, we tried to do some time lapse of my Mycena Interrupter while we were down there in an old mining brick bunker. Um, and... We, we noticed that halfway through the time lapse, this web was being woven underneath the fungus. And we thought, oh my God, there's a spider web d there. And then we looked closer and no, there was something that looked a little bit like a glowworm larva. And we thought, oh my gosh, we're going to get a glowworm in this time lapse. But it wasn't, it was a fungi gnat. And fungi gnats weave webs underneath mushrooms to collect the spores which they eat but also to catch insects. So they're their own separate organism living in symbi symbiosis, symbiosis with with the fungi. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's really cool. What about you Stephen? What's your favorite fungi and why? Well, I was going to say a, another blue one which grows near us but I'll st I'll go for the um, luminous fungi that mm. also grows around us in a lot, a lot of cases. And he's very popular with television audiences. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. That's great. Uh, and finally, you, Tara, do you have a favourite fungi? I'm going to narrow it down by fungi that I can eat ah, more than once. Yeah. Um, could, uh, and I don't know the actual Latin name or I don't know how to pronounce it. Maybe I will get help. But it's the fairy ring mushroom, which mm. I've seen growing in it's France and in the fairy ring mushroom? F fairy ring, oh, it's fairy called. Ring. Um, it's Marismus aurates or something like that. What's so special about it? Um, it's delicious. It's really uh. nutty <laughs> and it grows in a circle all the time, so it's quite cool. It's yeah. so hard to describe food, but if I sent you on an assignment for Gourmet Traveller, how would you describe how delicious it is? Hmm. I'd say it's kind of like almondy and salty at the same mm. time and that it's more full-bodied than a chanterelle. <laughs> okay, okay. I'm really hungry now. Um, I haven't had dinner. Um, thank you so much. I'm going to throw it open to the audience. Uh, th there's no mic going around, but if you ask the question, I'll hear it and I'll repeat it back to the audience. Yes, right there. Okay, I am going to try to condense that <laughs> wonderful, wonderful question. But we've got a few things going on there. The magic of mycelium, these dome-like structures, and as you've seen people engage with them, um, a lot of people have been talking about Mother Nature. There was a young child draped uh, themselves over it, talked about being the mother tree and the mycelium were the roots, and also the structure of the domes themselves are uh, kind of breast-like as well. Um, I think I made that comment when I first saw the pieces as well. Uh, does mycelium have a gender or is it non-binary? I don't think of it myself as having a gender, no. Um, but if I was to think about sort of network structures, mm. I would say that is perhaps more feminine, um, 
perhaps in terms of not being hierarchical or mm. phallic kind of structures versus field-like structures. Mm. Um, <laughs> but the way that they operate and our understanding of our social constructs of gender at least. Yeah, then I would yeah. perhaps say it sort of fits in with our social constructs of feminine identity. Yeah. Um, if I could thinking? just yeah. make a comment here, there is a mushroom which is really quite common called Schizophilum commune. Mm -hmm. A funny sort of name, but it has 36,000 sexes. Wow. So uh, certain members of the Liberal Party <laughs> take note. <laughs> so gender in fungi is nothing like anything that we know of other gender. Mm. So um, because, you know, that particular mushroom, Steve can probably tell you more about it, but basically they're very adapted to being able to reproduce in many, many ways. I want to know how you even ascertain that. Do you know what I mean? Like, how do you discover that? Because I know that, you know, I watched that film Minari recently and I know some people's jobs is to look at little chicks and to determine what gender they are. How do you determine the myriad genders, plural, of, of this organism? I'm going to have to say I have no idea. I mean, it's a very personal <laughs> question, isn't it? It's very... <laughs> um, but that's so, so interesting. Thank you so much for that question because I don't think we would have discovered that interesting tidbit otherwise. Um, thank you. Any more questions from the audience about mycelium, about the art, the work they do? Yes, a person in a hat. So we yes. So we mentioned before that um, trees and plant life can communicate through each other through mycelium. Uh, they can communicate whether there's disease or a threat. What is the mechanism? How does that actually work? Where one plant would be able to communicate through mycelium to another? What's going on? The the basic mycelial connection is with ectomycorrhizal fungi and these fungi connect to tree roots, provide the tree with minerals and water and the tree provides the fungus with carbohydrates, food. And in fact the tree will photosynthesize at approximately twice the rate with ectomycorrhizal fungi than it will without. So that fungus will connect to so one tree's roots, and also connect to a lot of other trees' roots. Now, they don't know exactly how the messages get across, but they've done measurements and seen a, an infected, a tree that's been attacked by insects and made sure there was no communication through um, airborne chemicals, you know, bagged the leaves up and so on and then tried infecting another tree and found there was a resistance after a certain amount of time. So it's really the fact that it happens has been demonstrated exactly the mechanism they don't know, which is common with lots of things with, mush with fungus that we don't know most of what goes on, in fact. There is a, a woman who's uh, recording the sound of mycelium and maybe there's a key to how that happens in her work. So she puts, um, I presume, electrodes onto the ends of mycelium and then she can hear that it's making noises. Wow. So she records that and then So that's not just music. growth itself, it's maybe the way that it's operating um, on a basic level. Mm. I understand that to be the case, yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you so much for your question. I think one of the big things that I got from hearing that is that there is still a lot that we don't know about this subterranean, hyperconnected world. Uh, is that is that fair to say? Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's the big worry is that you know, like every species on the planet, that you know, if we're destroying habitat and climate change is having an impact, we we are losing species. 
And although fungus will outlive human beings, for sure, I mean, it start, was here a long, long time before we were. And it's in the um, reactor in Chernobyl. <laughs> that's right. But we may be losing species before we get to know what mm. they do. Mm. So that's the big... That's the big rush at the moment. That's why we get invited overseas to record the biodiversity of fungi in forests mm. that have never had surveys done there before. I mean, when you talk about not having surveys done there before, does that also uh, indicate that there would be so many, I don't know if species is the word, but so many different types of fungi that are still yet to be identified and known? Almost all of them are unidentified. Almost really. all. We've identified about, or well, we've named about 150,000, and they think there's around 6.2 million species. Well, there's a lot of sexes between them. If we've <laughs> talked about one just having already uh, multiple sexes. The people we go out with in Yunnan, the mycologists, who go out into the forest every fungi season, one in five species they find will be new to science. Wow. And they go back to the same site next year and they'll find still one in five new species. Because you go to a, a particular patch of forest at one time one year and you'll get certain species come up. You go back in a couple of weeks' time and there'll be different species. Mm. So everything is very variable and there are a lot of different species. Most of the species in Australia probably are new species. We've just named them, oh, it looks like a European species. It's probably not. If, once they get around to doing DNA barcode testing, they find, oh, it's actually something different. Wow. And uh, if you are to find a mushroom here and it isn't known, uh, you can send it down to Melbourne to the... What's the place you send it to? Royal Botanic Gardens is one. Yeah, and you get to name the mushroom if it's not been discovered already. <laughs> okay, that's a really, really fun task. Yeah. Um, <laughs> have you got a name in mind for the first mushroom you discover? <laughs> no, I should work on that. <laughs> <laughs> it's either like we all need to think about our mushroom names and our drag names. Uh, those are the things that we need to all workshop in our own uh, time. Um, any more questions from the audience? We've probably got time for one or two more. Yes, uh, yes, person in the uh, blue shirt, or bluish shirt, I think. Can you find fungus on the moon, for example? I mean, you were talking before... Um, I mean, fungus wouldn't be native to the moon, but you were saying that we could grow structures on the moon. Would that be done on the moon? Yeah, so they'd, but the, the experiment with that is that they would take the mycelium to the moon mm. in, in, you know, Petri dishes and then grow and what they'd use as a substrate I'm not sure yet so mm -hmm. that's in early days. I actually I don't know the answer to that question whether fungi exists in other places whether even whether it's been found in meteor I think it's been pieces. found in a meteorite yeah. hasn't it? I don't wow. think they've found any signs of life on the moon they're searching for signs of life on Mars at the moment and I think there's some expectation that they probably will find some signs of life, whether it's fungus or more likely bacteria. We'll just have to wait and see, I guess. Mm. I Thanks. guess in terms of what it needs to grow, one thing it doesn't need is light. And so I think I always thought that mushrooms liked the dark, but it's actually that just that they don't need light. Mm. Um, and if you grow them with light on them, they'll go a darker colour. Oh, wow. Okay. I did not know that. Um, thank you so much for your question. Um, any more questions out there? Yes, one there. Oh, okay. An interesting uh, question. So, when you were first starting out, before you are the rock stars of the <laughs> photography and fungi world that you are now, um, how were you funding it? What was going on in order for you to continue your work? Firstly, I'd like to point out we don't get paid the same as rock stars. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I used to work in the computer industry and I retired reasonably early but lived on my ill-gotten gains from the computer industry and took photos. I, I honestly never expected to make any money out of mushrooms at all. 
and it just built up and people decided to like the photos and the BBC wanted to use the time lapse and they wanted to pay for it. So it, it sort of built up and we're actually probably earning a little bit of money now. Mm. Just in the last year, probably, what you'd call an income. But, but we've always volunteered our times, you know. Steve's, um, you know, we kind of think of ourselves as modern day naturalists, you know, like in we have the means, we have the leisure time and we're out there with our tools of trade documenting the natural world just like they did in the 1900s, 1800s and 1900s. But, yeah, we have got to a point now where, oh, my God, I monetized a video the other day and I went and I thought we'd earn just a tiny little bit of money and... I've been shocked. So, you know, it's been amazing that we can actually earn a living from this, potentially. Mm. Thank you so much for your question. Um, we are going to wrap it up soon, but before we go, um, as we go through all of the curiosity, sometimes I think the curiosities actually come with homework. You know, like, for instance, with um, Mewa AR, where you can use your phone and look at what uh, Turrbal and Yagara land around you in that space looked like pre-colonisation. I think there's homework for all of us to meditate on um, what, what we think decolonisation means, to think about this continent's history. When it comes to my mycelium... What kind of homework would you like us to go away with? What would you like us thinking about? What would you like us doing? I mean, finding a mushroom, a new mushroom, and naming it after yourself is pretty good homework. Is there anything else? Yeah, I reckon the next time you go into your backyard or a forest, that instead of just looking at the plants, you just take a moment and think about all those organisms under your feet, inside the leaves, inside the trunks of the tree, and realise, and you know, just get into that sense of it's all connected, it's all interconnected. And then the only other thing I would say is, if you are interested in um, being a citizen science scientist, there is an app um, for Fungi Map, which if you they're looking for particular species where the occurrence of them is all over Australia, you take a photo, you send it in on the app. And then that gets included in the Atlas of Living, Australian Atlas of Living Things. So that's a good thing to do, and kids love that stuff. Fantastic. Stephen, any homework for us? I'll just spend more time in the forest, I think. <laughs> you know, that, I keep going back to that, and that's what you know, I get most out of. I could say, you know, study the science of it, but if you go and look for mushrooms and find them. If you're interested enough, you'll go and look them up and then you'll gradually learn more. But mm. the learning is an offshoot from the beauty. Yeah, immerse yourself. What the Japanese call forest bathing. Forest bathe more. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> uh, and what about you, Tara? Any homework that you have for us? Apart from finding your own, discovering yeah. a mushroom. <laughs> um, I'm not too sure. We've actually uh, got some mushroom fungal material growing on the base of our uh, installation. I've been trying to work out what it is, uh, so if you're able to help with that, that would be awesome. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> well, also a really good call to action to make sure that you see the installation, the magic of mycelium yeah. as well, which is, can you just direct everyone here from, so from here where do you go? So it's kind of up behind us, so you would go, I think you have to leave out that way, uh, you go up the stairs and then round to the right and you'll see the four domes there outside the museum entrance. Fantastic. Um, you can also listen, each dome has a QR code which tells you about a different female mycologist. Mm. So you could get educated that way as well. So fantastic to make sure that we foreground the stories of women scientists who historically have often been quite marginalised as well. So another really important component of your work. Um, listen, it's been such a great afternoon and evening of conversations here at World Science Festival. Um, before we finish up, we've just got a few thank yous. The Queensland Government through Tourism and Events Queensland to the Brisbane City Council, the Brisbane Economic Development Agency for their support of Curiosity Brisbane. Thank you also to Curiosity Brisbane's major partner, the Courier Mail and media partner, Nine Queensland, and Curious Conversations partner, 
NBN Co, who are providing the support for us to live stream these curious conversations globally around the world. Um, thank you also to our precinct partners, Brisbane City Council, South Bank Parklands, and Arts Queensland, State Library of Queensland, and Queensland Museum. But of course, could you all join me in saving our final thanks for our wonderful guests tonight, Catherine, Stephen, and Tara. Thank you.